podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, uh, welcome to the Great Plains Laboratory PowerPoint presentation on IgG food allergy. And, and what I'll be talking about is the, the, the great usefulness of this test, even though this is also a test that gets a lot of flack. And, and the reason is because of things in the past that there was not as much documentation in the past. And so some of the critics of the test bring up the things from the past that are no longer applicable. And, and so I'll be uh, indicating in this presentation that this testing is extremely well documented at the, at the present time. And, and even more important, it's one of the most useful uh, tests. And, and so the uh, American Allergy Group says that, uh, and this would, again, is in 2003, notice that, so it's nearly 20 years ago, but people still bring this up. It's unproven. However, uh, almost all the proof of it has happened in the last 20 years. So unfortunately, the critics uh, haven't kept up with that, and they still, uh, bring out the the old uh, uh, statement of the allergy uh, group. So scientific studies now document the IgG food allergy test is useful in a wide range of disorders. A whole bunch of studies in autism and asthma, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, bipolar depression, uh, schizophrenia, so in fact, virtually all the psychiatric diseases, as well as neurologic conditions like ataxia or dizziness, seizures, anxiety, obesity, migraine headaches, uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus and myopathy. And what I found is that the IgG food allergy test is one of the most useful clinical tests that there is for a wide range of disorders. And, and uh, if you adopt a elimination diet based on results from this test, invariably you'll get uh, good clinical responses, sometimes uh, good, sometimes spectacular. And so it's a very, very useful, uh, very useful test for almost any chronic uh, illness. So uh, we'll be talking about IgG. There are four major uh, antibodies uh, that occur in the blood, and they can be remembered by the acronym GAME, uh, G-A-M-E. Uh, and and um, uh, IgG is the antibody that's present in the uh, highest concentration in the uh, in the bloodstream. And it is one that's uh, very essential. So, for example, you can live uh, a fairly long life with a complete deficiency of IgA, but if you were born with a complete deficiency of IgG, uh, you would be not long for the world. You might only last a, a, a day or two before some uh, terrible illness uh, took your life. So IgG antibodies are the ones that are uh, the secondary response to a uh, an immune challenge, which can be a parasite or a microorganism, bacteria, candida, mold, uh, uh, amoebae, and things like that. Uh, IgM is the first antibody produced by the immune system when encountering a new germ, uh, or uh, could also be if you're exposed to a food for the first time, as your first exposure to a particular food, you might develop a uh, IgM antibodies uh, against it. Uh, IgG is 
is uh, extremely important for food allergies. And one of the and the, one of the major reasons is because that three of the four subtypes of IgG bind complement, and the binding of complement then leads to inflammation. IgG four is not uh, quite is not nearly as useful because it is not an antibody that binds complement. And so I do, do recommend not using uh, tests that only check for IgG4. That And the uh, most of the laboratories I'm offering the test do total IgG, uh, as does uh, Great Plains Laboratory. Uh, IgA antibody is the antibody that's involved in the protection of the uh, nasal passages and the intestinal mucosa and also the tears uh, in the eye. So I've seen cases where the person has recurrent eye infections and it's because they have a complete deficiency of IgA. And IgE antibody is the antibody that's most widely known for its involvement in severe allergies typically the kind that are called uh, anaphylactic uh, reactions. And, and in many cases, the person uh, doesn't even require testing for IgE because they've already know from experience, uh, oh, if I eat strawberries, I break out all over, or I have difficulty breathing if I'm exposed to mold or something like that. So many times uh, the IgE antibody test can be very useful and sometimes the person can't figure it out. But in most cases, the person uh, already uh, knows about it. The IgE antibody is the one that the traditional allergists use the uh, skin prick testing, typically on the back uh, to they introduce a small amount of antigen, and if there's a severe IgE reaction, there's a uh, a large uh, flare, a uh, red flare on the back, and the size of the lesion is uh, related to the severity of the allergy. So uh, all antibodies uh, consist of at least one. Uh, molecular group that forms the letter Y. Uh, the other antibodies will sometimes have multiple copies of this Y molecule uh, joined together and can form a, uh, a big polymer or ring structure. IgG antibodies are some of the simplest and, uh, and, and with the IgG antibodies, the the part of the molecule that is uh, the same is the bottom part of the molecule. The, the place at the top, at the tips of the uh, Y structure of the antibody are the place where the antibody attaches or binds uh, to foods, bacteria, parasites, etc. And, and uh, this region of the antibody is variable. So uh, each antibody for a particular germ or for a particular food uh, has a different uh, uh, amino acid sequence that allows it to be highly specific for that particular antigen. <clears throat> so these are some of the differences <clears throat> between IgG and IgE allergies. So IgE is most known for its uh, ability to cause release of histamine, which can cause the uh, severe uh, anaphylactic uh, reaction. IgG, on the other hand, most of the time does not usually release histamine. There are cases where uh, that some IgG reactions actually have released histamine. Uh, the IgE antibody is usually uh, very quick after the exposure where 
the symptoms from IgG allergy may be delayed for for hours and sometimes even for uh, a couple of days. And, and it's most useful for the classic allergic reactions like uh, the skin reactions, hive, uh, sneezing, uh, asthma, uh, whereas the with the IgG, the IgG, IgG antibody does not cause anaphylactic shock, and and it is uh, very useful for for almost all uh, chronic illnesses. So it's hard for me to think of a chronic illness in which the IgG uh, food allergy results were not uh, helpful, very helpful. So some of the, the uh, most common food allergies are the uh, wheat and milk. So wheat and milk are the big, uh, some of the biggest players in the IgG uh, food allergy and uh, gluten includes uh, wheat, rye, and barley and casein is in cow's milk, but all the milk products, the cheese, yogurt, et cetera. And then in probably, and uh, uh, the third position would be uh, eggs. And most people are allergic to both the white and the, uh, uh, and the yolk of the egg. And probably, the next one in line would be the uh, yeast, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. On the Great Plains test, we list both baking and brewer's yeast. And in fact, they are the same species, uh, but the brewer's yeast has uh, genes that allow it to produce alcohol in, uh, in uh, great quantities. And, and, and a very important topic is celiac disease, and it's one in which there's the greatest confusion. I've seen many cases where the patient got inaccurate information from their uh, physician, and so I want to make sure that, uh, that everyone uh, listening to the webinar uh, understands uh, the importance of celiac disease, but also the non-celiac uh, gluten sensitivity as well. So uh, down here in the, in the, uh, in the uh, lower uh, right-hand corner is a picture of the intestinal mucosa. So each one of these little mountains here, so to speak, is uh, a, a villus. That would be the single uh, the, the uh, singular form of the word and the multiple uh, uh, structures like this would be referred to as uh, villi. And on top of each one of these little mountains are a whole series of small mountains called uh, micro uh, villi. And so by having villi on villi, it, this greatly increases the absorptive uh, capacity of the intestine. And so if you have celiac disease, uh, many times there's a flattening. So these villi are lost. So instead of these, these villi all throughout the intestinal lining, there's just flat surfaces in which both the villi and the microvilli are uh, missing. And, and when they're missing, what happens is absorption of food is greatly impaired. So it's, uh, in severe cases, the person is, is uh, emaciated because they're, they're, they're not absorbing a lot of different foods and the person has uh, loose stools because of the inability to uh, absorb the digested food as it passes down the intestine. Uh, so the, the blood test or serologic test, uh, you do have to be eating gluten before testing. So if the person has been off of wheat for six months and 
the there's a good chance that the blood test would would not uh, uh, be accurate. And and it's and I commonly get asked, well, how long do you need to be taking gluten to before it will show up? I really don't advise that. I would say if the person went on a wheat restricted diet and got and the clinical results showed they were much better, I don't think I would recommend that person do testing. I would tell the person there's a good chance you have some type of wheat sensitivity. We don't know if it's if it is celiac or non-celiac uh, wheat sensitivity. Um, and uh, but since you've uh, had a good reaction, we'd recommend that you just stay off that food. Uh, the the test that's considered equivalent to the uh, GI specialist doing an endoscopy in which a lighted tube is put into your small intestine. The uh, the the uh, antibody test that is specific for celiac is called the IgA uh, anti transglutaminase antibody, and there is a uh, a a deficiency in in this test in that. Uh, complete deficiency of the IgA antibody is common. So a person who has celiac disease and also has IgA deficiency would come back with a false negative with this test. Uh, even in this test, though, uh, you could do the IgG uh, antibody to wheat would still be positive. So in the case of a person with IgA deficiency, uh, if they wanted an absolute uh, confirmation, they would have to do the uh, endoscopy test where they look at the, the villi in the intestine, uh, or uh, they, they could uh, just do the IgG test uh, and show the wheat sensitivity and really not know whether they have uh, celiac wheat sensitivity or non-celiac wheat sensitivity. However, in both cases, the person should eliminate wheat. I've had so many cases where a physician would tell the patient, uh, oh, if you're negative for celiac, you can eat wheat. And that's not, that is not true. Uh, and you could also just try an elimination diet. That's the completely uh, fee-free test. Uh, and you just try uh, a gluten-free diet and see if the symptoms uh, resolve. So uh, there have been many studies uh, showing uh, neurologic and psychiatric manifestations of of, uh, of, of both celiac disease and uh, non-celiac wheat sensitivity. Here's one from a research group at, uh, at uh, John Hopkins in the University of Maryland uh, Medical School. And, uh, and so it's found that, uh, that there uh, uh, many uh, psychiatric symptoms associated with, uh, with wheat sensitivity. Uh, wheat sensitivity can also present as a, a severe neurologic illness. So uh, in this uh, particular study, uh, they looked at 83 uh, patients and they they found that there was a high incidence of neurologic disorder. So 29 of the patients had ataxia, meaning uh, dizziness and uh, incoordination. 29 had neuropathy, uh, meaning uh, nerve inflammation, uh, myopathy, muscle uh, problems, and, uh, and uh, going down uh, dementia as well. And so even uh, dementia or Alzheimer's has, uh, has been associated with 
uh, wheat sensitivity. This was, in the same article, this was a, a, a very good uh, comparison showing the, the uh, atrophy of the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is in this uh, lower part of the, uh, of the brain and, and the person came in compare, uh, complaining of ataxia and uh, the neurologist did not find anything to uh, any any cause of this at the first visit and then they came back 15 months later and all their symptoms were much more severe and now when they do a uh, a brain scan uh, a brain scan when you look at the uh, cerebellum you see all these uh, folds in the uh, cerebellum the striations are are uh, starting to disintegrate because there's atrophy of the cerebellum, the part of the brain that's responsible for maintaining uh, balance. So the authors recommend that that uh, you consider the possibility of the wheat affecting the brain. Uh, and not always the intestinal tract. And so they find that many people with neurologic disorders um, uh, may have uh, the atrophy of the villi in the intestine, but two thirds uh, do not. And so the, the main uh, symptoms may be neurologic and uh, psychiatric. And so they recommend the gluten-free diet, uh, even on patients who have uh, who are celiac negative. This is a uh, another article indicating the uh, effect of uh, wheat sensitivity on uh, on uh, and on this case on the uh, muscle. So. Mm -hmm. They, they had seven patients and four showed uh, significant clinical improvement on a gluten-free diet. And one of the patients refused and, their, and uh, their symptoms of the myopathy continued to become worse and worse. And, and uh, again, it is thought that this is due to the uh, antibodies to wheat causing the inflammation. Uh, here's another case. In this case, it's lupus erythematosus, a common, uh, what, what is considered autoimmune disease. But in effect, it could be that the wheat sensitivity is the main factor in the autoimmunity. Uh, and it was found that, uh, that uh, the symptoms of the lupus improved uh, rapidly once the uh, wheat was eliminated. And uh, uh, here's yet another case of uh, neuropathy and what is called the uh, axonal neuropathy. And uh, there were a high number of patients who had the IgG antibodies against gliadin, which is another part of the gluten molecule. And uh, they looked at 35 patients, 25 patients uh, went on the diet and 10 did not. And there was significant improvement in the neurologic symptoms of the patients uh, on the diet and the, the 10 that did not go on the diet continued to deteriorate. And uh, in, uh, again, uh, another example uh, in uh, ataxia in which up to 40% uh, uh, of the cases were uh, wheat sensitive. And, uh, and when, uh, uh, and had improvement of the uh, symptoms and also the antibodies uh, disappeared after going on a, 
a, a wheat-free diet. The uh, one of the illnesses in which the wheat-free and most and also very commonly the uh, milk-free diet has been used is in autism. And uh, many years ago, I went to a international conference in the Netherlands. It was a five-day conference starting on Monday morning and ending on Friday night. And they had probably 30 or 40 speakers just talking about the uh, common treatments of uh, autism. And one of the people in the audience was uh, a mother with a, a small child with severe autism. And the very first presentation of the day was about the uh, using the milk and wheat-free diet for treatment of autism. And she put her child on that diet uh, immediately after the seminar. Uh, the first talk was over. And by Friday of that week, most of the child's symptoms had uh, had uh, disappeared. So, uh, so, so, and this is not, uh, uh, this is not completely characteristic. This was an unusual improvement, but I will also say that, that uh, the vast majority of children with autism have some improvement and some like this particular mother uh, may have a, uh, a home run type of uh, benefit with the, uh, with the elimination diet. So in this particular uh, study, this is one of the ones done in, in uh, uh, Macedonia in, in uh, Central Europe. And, and uh, one of many studies that found that people with autism uh, have much higher amounts of IgG antibodies uh, than their normal siblings. Uh, this is another study by uh, a Dr. Cade at the uh, University of Florida, and and uh, Dr. Cade uh, was the one who uh, helped to develop the the uh, energy drink Gatorade. So so the uh, the University of Florida football team was practicing in the uh, summertime where the temperature in Florida was in the high 90s, uh, and the humidity was also in the uh, uh, extremely high. And so there was a lot of sweating going on, a lot of people getting sick from the uh, heat. And, and uh, Dr. Cade measured the electrolytes that were being uh, lost in the sweat and using that information developed Gatorade and then in turn, the Gatorade company uh, gave uh, Dr. Cade uh, research grants to uh, study autism and schizophrenia. And he found that high amounts of antibodies to wheat and milk were present in both populations, both uh, autism and in schizophrenia. This is somewhat interesting because in the early days uh, of of autism research, the condition was actually called uh, childhood schizophrenia. Uh, so Dr. Cade found that that about 90% of patients in both groups had these high amounts of antibodies, and that putting them on a milk and wheat-free diet was effective in reducing symptoms. Uh, the Great Plains Laboratory also did a study, and you can see here each of the diamonds represents the amount of antibody to casein in uh, people with uh, uh, children with autism here on the right compared to uh, normal people here on the, on the left. And you can see the values are much uh, higher in the uh, groups with autism, and other studies also found that that the the severity of autism was related to the uh, quantities of antibody. Those with the highest amount of antibodies uh, 
to milk were more likely to have uh, more severe symptoms. Uh, this is a, another study that was done this time at the University of Rome uh, Medical School showing a milk-free uh, diet gave uh, uh, caused significant improvement in behavioral symptoms after only uh, eight weeks on an elimination diet. And these children also had high antibodies to uh, uh, milk proteins. So uh, there have now been uh, multiple uh, double-blind studies of various diseases, disease, including this one in which uh, migraine patients with migraine headaches uh, were evaluated, and, and, and it was a double-blind, randomized crossover study, and so a very good study showing that uh, using the IgG food allergy test to recommend which foods were would be eliminated was highly effective in reducing uh, uh, migraine uh, uh, symptoms. So um, the it was found that there were uh, on average about 23 different food uh, allergens that were involved in the uh, migraine and frequently in irritable bowel uh, syndrome as well. And the elimination diet was associated with um, uh, significant reductions in the number of migraine uh, uh, attacks and the the length, if the person did have an attack, the attacks were shorter. So, uh, and the severity was also uh, reduced. And so significant improvement in quality of life. Um, so the, the, the summary was that findings indicate that food elimination diet based on IgG testing, uh, who suffer from irritable bowel may effectively reduce symptoms of both disorders uh, by that testing and diet in, uh, initiation. The IgG antibodies were found to be uh, clinically relevant to patients with uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, and they found that uh, that high amounts of IgG antibodies against uh, cheese and yeast were common. As a matter of fact, the the uh, antibodies against yeast are now considered a way of differentiating between different bowel diseases that uh, people with Crohn's disease commonly have. Uh, high antibodies to uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, and by eliminating the foods, the uh, daily stool frequency uh, decreased compared to a sham diet, and uh, abdominal pain was reduced and general well-being uh, improved by using the diet based on IgG testing. So IgG testing has also been uh, shown to be related to inflammation, uh, to uh, obesity, and to the uh, thickness of the intima of the arteries in these uh, patients with, uh, uh, with uh, food allergies. So this particular uh, graph shows the uh, total amount of IgG antibodies. If you take all the ones and add them up, the people with obesity had much higher values of IgG food allergy testing, which indicates that this testing may also be able to, the adoption of this diet may be helpful in obesity as well. It was found that 
there was also a correlation between the amount of IgG antibody, which is here on the x-axis, and the thickness of the intima of the arteries. So the the thicker the arteries, the uh, the more a tendency to uh, atherosclerosis. It was also found that the total amount of IgG was, uh, uh, food allergy was related to inflammation. So here we have C-reactive protein and a high correlation between those people with high amounts of, of uh, IgG uh, food allergy proteins and the amount of inflammation. So the summary is overweight people have more uh, allergies and higher IgG titers compared to people of normal weight. The IgG titers also correlate with the inflammation uh, uh, measured by C-reactive protein, CRP, uh, that that consumption of foodstuffs for which you have IgG allergies may initiate an inflammatory process, and this is thought to be the inflammatory process initiated by the the binding of the protein complement to the the IgG food allergy food antigen. Uh, complex. So in other words, when the food allergy antibody reacts against one of the food molecules, it binds the complement and initiation initiates uh, inflammation. Uh, in, this inflammation may also be involved in insulin resistance, which leads to greater obesity. And so the uh, Changing the diet in an obese person based on IgG may help to eliminate the inflammatory process that is partially responsible for uh, the weight gain. And then in addition, the, uh, the changes in the artery intima uh, thickness may also indicate uh, a relationship between IgG antibodies and atherosclerosis. Uh, several studies have also been done on irritable bowel syndrome. So again, this was a randomized control uh, tr uh, trial on patients with irritable bowel uh, uh, of 150 uh, patients in which they were given either a specific diet uh, based on the IgG food allergy testing uh, or a sham diet in which uh, they were also put on on restrictions of foods, but it was not the foods that they had antibodies to. And again, the conclusion is that the food elimination diet uh, caused a significant reduction in irritable bowel uh, symptoms. Uh, this is a uh, another another study of uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, twins who had developed Crohn's disease uh, had higher antibody titers toward yeast. So uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which I had mentioned previously, of all antibody types. So people with Crohn's, uh, you can distinguish people with Crohn's and uh, those with other uh, in inflammatory uh, bowel diseases by that the fact that Crohn's is associated with high antibodies uh, against uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, which also means, by the way, uh, people like this should probably also not get related uh, yeast like the a Saccharomyces boulardii is sometimes used as a uh, a probiotic, and it's highly likely that the uh, people with uh, Crohn, uh, Crohn's disease 
uh, might not react favorably to uh, the use of Saccharomyces boulardii. So the, uh, the, the presence of antibodies to Saccharomyces boulardii helps to prove that a bowel disease is not ulcerative colitis, for example. The uh, IgG antibodies have been found to have a, an important role in psychiatric conditions. So this is an article uh, out of John, the author is in uh, the John Hopkins Medical School and showing that individuals who have bipolar depression, which is when the person goes up and down, they, they can have days where they're and what is called the manic phase, where they think they're the uh, king of the universe and to being uh, extremely depressed. And so studies have shown that, that uh, they're much more likely uh, people with uh, high IgG antibodies uh, were, are, are uh, uh, much more likely to have uh, bipolar diseases. You don't have to change the medication in order to do uh, testing. And it was found that the amount of the antibody, so casein is the major milk protein uh, that's antigen, most commonly antigenic, and the amount of antibody in people with uh, bipolar uh, disorder is uh, associated with the severity of the manic phase. Uh, let's see, this is a repeat, so I'm going to skip that and now go over to the, uh, to the evidence that uh, wheat is a major factor uh, in, uh, in, in uh, schizophrenia, and they found that uh, individuals on a milk and wheat-free diet uh, began to uh, improve uh, when uh, all of the symptoms began to improve while on, in this, this case, they just focused on wheat, but they also did another study on milk. So uh, here we have, let's see, we've got eight, 11 different uh, uh, symptoms that are common in uh, schizophrenia. And the way it works is uh, here on each of the uh, x-axis is the time factor, so 14 weeks total treatment. And uh, on the y-axis is the rating, meaning uh, the severity. Uh, and the higher the rating, the more severe the symptoms. So, so for example, poor rapport, uh, meaning ability to, uh, to uh, get along, I guess you could say. Um, when uh, at the beginning of the study, they put them on a wheat-free uh, diet uh, right here and, and with the amount of time on the diet, you see there was a steady improvement in their symptoms as the, uh, the rating continued to go down. Remember, the lower value means um, the uh, symptoms are improving. And then right here, you see there's this black line. The black line is they put them back on uh, wheat in their daily food and and as soon as they put them back on wheat, all their symptoms began to uh, to uh, to get worse. And then uh, at 10 weeks, you can see they put them back on the wheat-free diet and their symptoms started getting better again. And so this was the case in virtually uh, every one of these uh, uh, different symptoms that are common in schizophrenia that they improved on a wheat-free diet, they uh, got worse when put back on wheat, and they got better again taking off wheat. So this was a really a, a dramatic study showing uh, the food sensitivity is a, 
a major factor in this terrible disease. But at around the same time, the pharmaceutical industry developed uh, the the uh, uh, phenothiazine drugs, and of course the the uh, the drug companies did not promote the use of uh, uh, wheat elimination that would not help to sell uh, their drugs. So so much of what goes on uh, in the medical field is uh, is uh, is funneled uh, through the the profits uh, made by the drug company, and if and unfortunately, there's very few people who profit from uh, a food being eliminated from the diet. Uh, this is another study showing uh, milk sensitivity, high amounts of milk antibodies uh, on. Uh, patients with uh, with uh, schizophrenia and psychosis. Uh, here's a case: uh, a patient from Great Plains with schizophrenia, and uh, the individual had uh, very high amounts of uh, antibodies. The ones this is uh, these are all the the uh, different uh, milk. Um, milk proteins and cheese and yogurt. And also you'll notice that right here is the antibodies to goat. So, and this is what we find in most people. So that uh, goat milk is not a, uh, a, a good substitute for cow's milk in most people. If they're allergic to cow's milk, most individuals are also have sensitivity to goat milk as well. But in addition, uh, the person also had uh, high amounts of uh, antibodies uh, to uh, eggs, uh, had lesser amounts of antibodies to wheat, and had significant antibodies to kidney beans. So that is uh, one of the more unusual uh, antibodies. And uh, I what I found out based on my own experience is that uh, I only pay attention to moderate or high uh, uh, values on the testing. Uh, I'm really not as concerned by the uh, very slight increases like here uh, of uh, soybeans or uh, other kinds of things. So I have a tendency to ignore those, I've found that in most cases they don't make any difference, and so the so that's an important thing when you're looking at these is just to focus on uh, the ones that are on the high end of the scale. You can uh, ignore those on the on the uh, lower end of the scale. Uh, this is a blow up from the previous case. So this person uh, with schizophrenia was, uh, while they were home and were on the diet, was doing quite well, but then they went off to college. And of course, the college, you got to uh, start eating pizza and stuff, which was full of the cheese, and the person uh, deteriorated while at college. Uh, this is a case study. Uh, of one of the physicians who had come to our conference, one of the psychiatrists, and treated a 16-year-old girl with uh, psychosis, and she had both auditory and visual uh, hallucinations. Uh, commonly, these uh, auditory hallucinations are, are uh, telling the person uh, there's something bad about them, that they're uh, they're not a good person, or they may be telling them uh, to do uh, terrible things, like to kill someone or something like that. So she had significant depressive symptoms and ended up in the psychiatric hospitals because of thoughts of suicide. And uh, her symptoms uh, improved somewhat with the the, the uh, drug Zoloft and Obilify, but she continued to have relapses where she would uh, go back to having the hallucinations. 
They had to keep on giving higher and higher amounts of the drugs, which of course then leads to uh, more uh, symptoms, more side effects. And um, when they did the food allergy testing, it came up high for casein, egg white, cheeses, and moderate elevations for cranberries, sugar, and kidney beans. So all these were eliminated from the diet. And, uh, and her psychiatrist said, I saw her today for follow-up. She was totally free of symptoms within a few days after starting the elimination diet. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis also uh, uh, improves with, uh, on, uh, on, with people on a elimination diet. And this was a little bit unusual in that it, in that uh, this also were uh, a vegetarian diet. So you can do an elimination diet uh, for people who are vegetarian as well. Uh, this is a, a another study of um, of um, arthritis again. Uh, the antibodies against food were uh, were much increased in the intestines of many uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So we already saw earlier the the improvement with the autoimmune disease lupus, and now a study showing uh, excessive food antibodies in rheumatoid uh, arthritis and um, and uh, there was uh, uh, a much higher amount of food antibodies in the uh, patients, and and uh, the and actually in this case, the uh, a, a drug helped to reduce sulfasalazine helped to reduce the number of uh, food allergies. This is a uh, a case of 114 uh, ENT uh, from, uh, patients, uh, ear, uh, nose, and throat, screened for IgG, uh, and the. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the the uh, uh, there were uh, some of the patients who did not uh, participate. Uh, they were lost to follow up. Five were all negative. Uh, Fifteen didn't start uh, on the elimination diet. And but 80 did. So the majority of people went on to the diet. And 25% uh, of those studies had incapacitating symptoms. And but they in achieved a 80% or greater improvement uh, while on the diet with 20% uh, of those having 100% improvement in 50% having 90% or more relief. And uh, so this was an open label study, but it was showing a very uh, useful uh, role for, for uh, IgG food allergy testing. And there was a, a tremendous variety of symptoms. So you see, it wasn't just one or two symptoms, it was a whole panoply of, 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 uh, of symptoms, diarrhea, cramps, cough, headaches, nausea, throat clearing, nasal uh, drainage, itchy eyes, sneezing, fatigue after meals, ringing in the ears. So, uh, so uh, some improvement in a significant uh, percentage of all of these patients. Uh, again, this is a bar graph showing uh, a wide range of improvement following uh, elimination diet based on IgG testing. Uh, 
The food uh, elimination diet was very s successful in treating fibromyalgia. So two weeks after eating uh, a large number of common food allergens, there was significant uh, reduction in, in uh, pain, headache, bloating. Uh, and in the study, corn, wheat, dairy, citrus, and sugar were the foods that were implicated the most as being problematic for fibromyalgia. Uh, there are different testing. So uh, this study was done by uh, a, and presented in one of the uh, naturopathic uh, journals comparing IgG and ALCAT. Uh, the conclusions were that the IgG testing showed consistency both in a split sample on a single day and over the course of a week in the reported results. And the ALCAT, which is based on uh, not changes in antibodies, but changes in the size of cells when, uh, when uh, exposed to uh, certain foods, was uh, was not reliable, and uh, and so the conclusion was IgG food allergy is reproducible and reliable, and the data are are very telling. Here on the right, you see the uh, uh, these are uh, split samples that were tested on different days using the IgG test. And the, uh, the thing that's important is uh, if everything were perfect in these tests, all the points would fall on, the, uh, on this uh, slanted line, the 45 degree angle line, meaning that every single result gave exactly the same result on both days. And with the IgG test, it was not perfect but it was extremely good. You can see the vast majority of points are on the line compared to the ALCAT test where it was like a dartboard. So in other words, I mean, there were only a few of the uh, uh, food allergens that were close to the same on both days. Most of them were scattered all over the map. So another question that gets asked is the IgG versus IgG4. And, 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 and so I had to make that decision. I examined all the literature. So uh, IgG4, number one, is only a small percentage of the total antibodies. Uh, but the most important thing is that the IgG4 has a very poor ability to bind complement, which is the thing that causes inflammation. So uh, the, the uh, measuring the IgG4 uh, is, is not very helpful in order uh, to, to determine uh, allergic uh, sensitivity. It's really the IgG1, 2, and 3 subclasses that are needed for that purpose. Uh, IgG4 has really been, um, is one that responds to if the person is giving injections of, of, of something they're sensitive to. Uh, and IgG4 is really, uh, can, can, uh, uh, bind a food or an antigen, and but without causing allergic reactions, and so it is blocking the exposure of an antigen to IgE. So really, IgG4 could be useful to determine if a person is getting over their allergy sensitivity by some kind of immunotherapy, and so it's often... Uh, uh, called a uh, a blocking antibody. Ig uh, IgA antibodies are also similar, not binding complement. And again, uh, 
uh, an antibody that is uh, uh, not, not since it doesn't bind complement, uh, having a lesser role in any food allergy. So the IgG1, 2, and 3 are all capable of causing inflammations because they uh, bind complement and cause inflammation. The, uh, and this study, this verifies that uh, IgA antibodies uh, also have the, um, the inability in serum to elicit complement activation and so are not as useful for causing clinical symptoms. So thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, attendance and I think you'll find that the uh, IgG food allergy test is extremely useful. Remember, don't focus on the small stuff. Focus on only moderate or elevated values. Borderline results are usually not going to cause any significant symptoms. So thank you very much and good luck.